right, how about the, all right, how about this? All right, isn't it funny? Once again, there is a Microsoft update, and it changes your microphone settings. Uh, why? I don't know. Anyways, now you got some sound. And as I transition through my different things, I, I'm going to have to redo everything. <laughs> so anyways, hey, 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 hey. Welcome to Forex.today, the YouTube community of more than 20,000 foreign exchange traders. We gather here today to trade CPI. But be careful because trading is risky. Now wait, I'm going to have to change the microphone. You ready? Oh no, it worked. Not appropriate for everyone. Your past performance, good or bad, is not necessarily indicative of future results. Please stay small, stay humble, focus in the long term. Never risk money, cannot afford to lose. My name is Wayne. I am here to salute you. No, I'm here to help. Let me know how it can help. What do you want to do today? CPI? Okay, let's do CPI. So I want to kind of look at some reasons why a headline CPI could be higher than expected and certainly higher than the last CPI, which may or may not be uh, good for our markets today. So we'll go, over, we'll go over some facts, then the news will actually come out in about 26 and a half minutes. <clears throat> we'll trade that volatility together. <clears throat> we'll talk about it. Oh, Glenn wants to know where can I get my template? investorbootcamp.com just go there it's $88 a year it's 100 hours of training well worth the 88 bucks but on top of that you download all the templates all the files there's hundreds of them and there's even auto installer so you download the the standard and then you under, uh, download the full and ha run the installer okay anyway so there you go so um, let's go to our live screen. Yeah, very cool. So we're going to use a couple of tools today. Uh, certainly we're gonna use TradeRs, an AI service that I launched uh, about a month ago, I guess. And uh, it's totally fantastic. And in particular, the Sonar thing um, really gives you some insight into the past. See, Sonars look, right, look down. And radars look up and out, right? Radars uh, see the future, so to speak, and sonars see below. So anyways, that, <laughs> in the past. Uh, so that's how we break it out. So we're going to use that tool because it, it, it analyzes past volatility. And that not just the past volatility of like, let's say, headline CPI, but it looks for patterns in the volatility. Yeah. Also, the, the trading platform that I use and I recommend is Trader's Way. They're uh, an ECN brokerage firm, which means they don't trade against you, which, in my opinion, that means they have an, uh, an ethical business model that uh, is aligned with your best needs and your best interests. So they're a... a, a, a you know, a business partner, a trading partner, an execution partner that I appreciate. And so I've been recommending um, this ECN for nearly 10 years. And when you start using tools like the, these AI tools that I'm developing for you, um, you may want that ECN. Um, yeah. So anyways, uh, Trader's Way is what I use and I recommend them to you as well. But let's get on with it because we don't have a lot of time before the news comes out. Thank you for completing the poll. Okay. You have about 10 seconds if you haven't done it already. Okay. What will the year over year headline CPI be today? Will it be 3.1? Will it be 3.2? Will it be 3.3? Will it be 3.4? Okay. If you want a deeper dive into that discussion, I covered it in today's Quant Box, and I have already posted the video to the Quant Box YouTube channel, and that link should be in the, uh, be in the description below the video that you're watching now. Okay. Great. Now, Richard falls into the same trap every day. Sorry, Richard. <laughs> Richard, uh, by the way, I'm not beating you down. Uh, Richard participates, so this is good. So he says, I think it will come out hotter. 
I couldn't care. You have to follow that up, Richard. You think it'll become it comes out hotter because X, Y, and Z. You have to back up your opinion, otherwise it's a worthless opinion. So don't don't say things like that, right, Richard? I'm just prepping you. You say, well, with things like this. Okay, this is at EIA.gov. And I'm looking at gasoline prices week over week going up. Okay. That kind of thing. Okay. And at some point, if that has started, you know, it, I mean, you can download this and get more. But um, let's say there's a, a trend with oil prices having gone from 65 to 75 to 85 and on its way higher. Uh, at some point, those higher prices creep in to the headline. So let's see. You guys believe... It's going to come out 3.4. Yeah, so it's going to go from 3.2 to 3.4. That's a big jump, by the way. Okay, that's a very big jump. But that's what you think. So you should back that up. And this would be one. We also know that things like wages are high. They're up 5.1% year over year. Well, that would be inflationary. The worst thing you can do is pay somebody more money. It has a horrible economic uh, impact. It seems to be a strange concept, right? Well, if somebody doesn't have much money and they need more money to live, you should find a way to give them more money, right? No. Cash is trash. So what you should do is find a way to give that person more opportunity and that increases productivity. And if lots of people have more opportunities, then lots of people are contributing to productivity. And when you have an increase in productivity, prices fall. And now you don't need so much money. So for example, housing is part of our sticky inflation and it doesn't look like it's gonna go away. Why is there a problem there? Well, we have we need in the United States millions and millions and millions more homes. Well, let's say 2 million. The United States right now could use 2 million brand new homes right now. Well, it takes a while to build a house, right? 6 to 12 months. Okay, cool. So why don't we just have a government program where the government builds entire neighborhoods in places where uh, we want to uh, stimulate the economy? Well, the problem is we don't have enough workers. We don't have enough carpenters. We don't have enough concrete guys. We don't have enough plumbers. We don't have enough electricians. We don't, and even if we could build the houses, uh, I don't know if we have enough factories to build the windows and build the shingles and and all that kind of stuff. And, and do we have enough paint? If we were going to double or triple the, the rate in which we build new homes, do we have enough paint? Do we, well, if we, if we did that there and the government supported it, then there would be a rationale for paint companies to expand their productivity and, and increase their hiring, buy, buy, get some more staff, double their productivity, right? Double their production. Well, when you double the production of paint, the price per can of paint will drop 30%. Disinflationary. Now you don't need so much money. And that's in one industry. And then suddenly housing, we have affordable housing for people and people are working. And now you don't need an increase in wages. You increase in productivity, lowered the price. So now you don't need much money. The problem is when you give people money, it's inflationary, but their problem is inflation. 
So when you give somebody that doesn't have enough money more money, all you do is put them in a situation where they need more money, which means then they need more money, then they need more money, and pretty soon you make a million dollars a year and you're dead broke because it doesn't buy you a loaf of bread. Okay, so we need to fix these things. Okay, you want gasoline prices to go down. Why don't you lower the price of crude? Well, how do you lower the price of crude? Have a government that supports the exploration and acquisition of raw crude oil. Instead, we have a government that says those people are bad and that those companies are greedy. And that, you know, this, that, and the other thing. So what happens is, guess what? You're going to have to pay more. Okay, let's quickly go. Uh, we only have 15 minutes. So let me quickly get into trade ours. Okay. By the way, just in case you haven't seen this, okay, a longer term pound dollar up trade. This came out 15 minutes ago. This came out an hour ago. Euro dollar uh, um, up. Or sorry, Euro Aussie up on a 30 minute chart and on a 15 minute chart. Okay, modest, modest up on euro dollar on, a, on an hourly chart. You, these are all new, right? These are all new setups. Look at what Tradars is doing for you. Okay, look at this. Euro yen, technically, it's a breakout trade to an upside target of 65 and a half, 165 and a half to almost, let's say, 166 and a quarter. That's, that's nice, right? So it's doing swing trades and scalps and position trades. And these are all new. And that's just Forex. It does crypto. It does the uh, individual stocks like Moderna, Netflix, Microsoft. It does commodities. Okay. Cool, right? And indices. So these are radars. It's looking into the future. These are trade plans. It's planning trade setups. And then at some point, if it breaks this, it becomes an active trade. And now it's risk management is the issue. So you can go to Forex and say, show me the trades with at least 60% probability of success now that they're in play. See, all the stops are already at break even because you plan them and then they're, they're working. So you move the stop and now you got to manage the trade. So you can say, um, you know, give me all the trades with at least 70% probability of success. And there they are, USD Rand on the hourly chart and Euro Pound on the four hour chart. Cool. But that's all about the future. For this event, we want to look at the past. We have 13 minutes and right? Exactly. 13 minutes. Great. So we could take a look at this and here's all the different major currencies, major defined as a dollar pair. So these are all the dollar pairs. And we're looking at, and we're breaking them down each of the pairs. We're looking for patterns on, on many different charts, but definitely the two hour, the four hour, right? Two days, two hour, four hour, 12 hour, two days. And these are patterns that have occurred in the past. The next thing is, if the actual is less, and this is the month over month, if, the, if inflation falls, okay, in the next two hours, there's a 75% chance Aussie dollar goes up. Now, how does it figure out the chance? It's not actually a chance. It's what it did in the past when CPI came out less than expected. If it comes out greater than expected, there's a 100% chance Aussie dollar falls in the first two hours. Holy smokes, wouldn't you like to know this? And then if it comes out actual, okay, okay, that looks like in the past that's disappointing. Actual is disappointing. So if it comes out 0 
Well, now there's no discernible pattern on the two-hour chart for Aussie dollar. Remember, we, if if it came out higher or lower, there was patterns on the two, the four, and the and the two-day, right? So a scalp, a spot, and a swing trade, right? But if it comes out as expected, there's only a four-hour pattern. It doesn't see patterns on the other time frames for Aussie dollar in scenarios in which CPI in the United States month over month came out as expected. But that one pattern, 75% of the time is down. So that's really interesting. You're like, okay, these are nice little statistics, but how does it work? So let's say you know you guys believe... Okay, about, about two-thirds of you believe it'll come out higher than expected. So here's one way to play that game. You go to the actual is greater than expected. What do you want to trade? Euro-dollar? Okay, let's do Euro-dollar. Scalp for two hours? Okay, let's scalp for two hours. So you open this up. And it, it diagrams your trade plan. Okay. We can draw the following conclusions about the expected movement of euro dollar based on the last 12 inflation rate month over month events in the United States. If the actual is less, 75% chance the two hour trend will be up. But if the actual is greater than expected, 100% chance the two hour trend will be down for euro dollar, specifically euro dollar. So it's nice. Now, when the news comes out, what it'll do is if it does come out higher than expected, it'll delete this all this analysis for the less than expected. So it updates itself. It's all dynamic. You don't have to refresh your page or anything. It's all dynamic. This is not a web page. This is a database. So it'll say, oh, my God, it came out greater than expected, and it'll delete all the other stuff or vice versa. So here's what the trade plan looks like. Greater than expected, down. Okay, better than expected, up. So, and it's nicely labeled here. And just over the next two, uh, two hours. Okay? Great. So, how does it make that conclusion, you say? And that is an intelligent question. So you say, well, show us the past trade R's, and it'll show you. Okay? Okay, if the actual is greater, this is what it thinks will happen. Why? <clears throat> because in February, the news came out greater than expected, and euro dollar dropped and closed lower two hours later. In January, greater than expected, euro dollar dropped and two hours later closed lower. Okay. Back in December, okay, it came out, right? It dropped and closed lower two hours later, okay? Back in October, it dropped and closed lower two hours later. Whoa. 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 So maybe something, maybe. Remember, past performance does not predict future results, but now it's actually proving it to you. And imagine all the data this database has to be able to show you hours before and hours after on every major uh, um, news event going back years and years and years. And then analyzing the patterns that that volatility produced and realize, too, that it's deleting 90% of the information. Okay. All right, Jimbo would like to see the performance, right? Okay, cool. Let me show you. I mean, you can ask people. I, I, I'm stunned how good it is. But it, there's a built-in backtester. Jimbo. So you take a look at it and say, okay, let's say on 4x pairs, uh, we want to look at some patterns. Okay. Oh, uh, okay, there we go. Uh, we want to look at the patterns. 
And it's seen ascending triangles, channel down, channel up, descending triangles, double bottoms, double tops, falling wedges, flags, head and shoulders, inverse head and shoulders, pennants, rectangles, resistance, rising wedges, support triangles, and triple tops. It's seen this one 785 times, this one 1,710 times, this one 1,690 times, 715 times, 74 times, 64 times, 1,769 times, 700, oh, 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 oh my God. It's seen 9,134 triangles in 4X, only looking at 4X on all the different time frames, okay? And how many did it see? And then how many times did the pattern, remember, it only looks at patterns, and it it knows what the pattern is supposed to produce. Do you understand that? Like a rising wedge produces a certain outcome. A triple top produces a certain outcome. Would you all agree? A flag pattern, a wedge, they all have predictable outcomes, don't they? Cool. So it looked at it 785 times, and it was correct 544 times, for a 69% accuracy, 76% accuracy, 74% accuracy, 74% accuracy, 78% accuracy, double tops, 81% accuracy, falling wedges, 69% accuracy, flags, 70% accuracy, head and shoulders patterns, seen at 145 times in Forex, right? 118 times at work for 81% accuracy. Well, Wayne, what about inverse head and shoulders? Well, even more common, 156 times, 140 times at work, 90% accuracy, and pennants are full of crap. Don't trust a pennant. Seen it almost 800 times, it's 50-50. It's don't trade it. Don't trade pennants. They're not reliable because Tradars remembers all 800 times it's seen them, and it cannot find a discernible pattern. So on and so forth. Oh my God, yeah. So, that's that. Okay. Okay. Well, the AI parameters, it's just looking for patterns. So like, let's say you teach the machine to say, um, in a scenario where you see price do this over time, okay, you could say, well, we think it'll do something like this. And then you would measure this distance and then project that, right? And then you would say, so the goal here would be to get uh, things to sort of this range, right? So you just teach it, Jimbo. It's not complicated. You know how to do technical analysis. The thing is it can do it on 7,500 charts at a time. And remember every single instance it, it's watching. Okay, and so you teach it like this. You just teach it basic technical analysis like I've taught you basic technical analysis. And then you track how many times does it work and how many times does it fail. And then you just say, oh, well, 57% of the time this worked. Well, that's not very good, so don't trade these. But when you see things like this, okay, it works almost every time. Oh, yes, obviously. Jim. Yeah, Jimbo, you're right. Good good question, Jimbo. Again, and it's real time. Okay, 28 minutes ago, pound dollar. Okay, here's the pattern. You see? Okay, we're about three and a half minutes. And here's the expiration date. Inverse head and shoulders has broken through the resistance line Okay, today, possible bullish price movement, like just 28 minutes ago, right? Possible bullish price movement forecast for the next five days towards, so it's a swing trade, you see that? Up to the 27 to 27.50 level. Okay, and if it doesn't occur, 
and right it'll expire here i mean this just came out but it's also looking at things on the 30 minute it's looking at things at the 15 minute it's looking at things on the hourly so it does scalping and spot and swing and all that it's gorgeous but it only does technical analysis that's all it does It doesn't understand the meaning of inflation coming out in one minute and four seconds. Okay? It doesn't understand the meaning, but it looks in the past, which does not predict future results, but it looks in the past and it just knows what happened in the past in that situation. Right? Okay, you know what I'm talking about? All right, so let's move this. Uh, oops, and move that, and move that. Oh, that shouldn't be open. Uh, I'm going to watch the stock market. You can watch Euro Dollar or whatever. You do you, I'll do me. Uh, I'm very interested in the last hurrah here. So the numbers should be out. Let me get them for you. Oh, I can't see. Uh, get that ad out of the way. All right. Let's see. Uh, it's happening. It's coming out. It's coming out. And uh, 3.5. It's even worse. Oh, my God. It's even worse. Oh, my God. 3.8 core. Oh, my God. It's nasty. Uh, uh, 0.4, 3.5. Oh, it's nasty. Hey, think about it this way. I sent you an email an hour ago predicting it. You're welcome, by the way. But thank you for being here. Oh, my God. It's nasty. Oh, that's terrible. Uh, uh. So this is from yesterday. Let me remind you how I had this set up. Um, weeks ago, in fact, uh, I, I can just redraw it with my equidistant, right? Do you guys remember this is the way I had it? It was, uh, I did some conversation yesterday about something else, but, um, mm -hmm, I can't get that out there. Maybe I can do it this way. Oh, come on. Okay, yeah, so that's my ma massive concern, and holy smokes, eh? Holy smokes, eh? Oh, it's terrible. That's terrible. So now you're like, the, the, the issue is how could the Fed plausibly cut interest rates, right? In a situation where we have presumably, you know, out of control inflation. So I'm trying to get to this, but I can't talk and <laughs> do anything at the same time. Uh, yeah. Oh, my God. So, oh, my God. Oh, my God. So what did we say before the event? If the actual is greater than expected, Tradar said there was a 100% chance euro dollar falls. I, right? And I showed you all the other iterations in the past that created that drop. Okay, cool. Now, great question, Leo. Does this impact the uh, uh, gold? Uh, let me get you a video about that. Because I already covered that today, hours ago. Okay. Okay. And you want to watch, uh, let me actually pull up the actual video. I was going to give you the general link. Let me give you the specific link. Uh-oh, where did you guys go? No, where did the, I've lost the chat. Where did the chat go? Oh, here it is over here. Um, here it is, Leo. I covered it uh, two hours ago. Okay, Leo, you got me? Is the sound working? 
I think so. So there you go, Leo. Covered it two hours ago. Okay. So how, on a scale of one to ten, how, how cool was the Tradar's sonar for over, uncovering underlying patterns inside the volatility of this news event? Ten being the best, where it's at a hundred percent chance of down, or one being pathetic, useless, crap. Give it a 10 or a 1 or somewhere in between on how impressive it knows every 15-minute candle before and after every CPI going back years. And in fact, the only, right? And in fact, it ignored everything else. And it could filter out time frames that are worthless to you. So four minutes ago, the consensus was 3.4. It came out higher, right? Two-hour trend is down. It's got it all pointed out. And again, you can just click a button and pull from the database to see the past performance. So now you're like, I don't know if I get fundamentals. I don't know if I get it. What does CPI mean? How will the market move? And you're like, I don't know how to answer any of these questions. Um, well, we can... We can analyze technically the past performance and give you very, very, very clear and in totally transparent. Remember, this is totally transparent. It's showing you how it's made its calculations. Or like when Jimbo's like, well, how reliable are the patterns? Oh, well, that's built in full transparency. It's built in. Cool, right? Now the rest is up to you. Okay. You're probably wondering what it costs. Well, it starts at $19 a month. You're welcome. You're welcome. Cool. Yeah. Now imagine being able to scalp that or use it for spot trading, right? Yeah. So an hour ago, let's do it on a five minute chart. An hour ago, I sent you an email. How many people got the email? Cool. Let's see if I have my email up. I do. Okay, here it is. And I'll pop it up. All right. Uh, one hour ago. Hi, Wayne. I think the CPI news will be high today. This is, and, and this goes back to the comment uh, for Richard, right? Don't tell me this. You have to answer why. This is because of the rise in oil and gasoline prices. So I answered it. That's what matters. If we get a reading of 3.4 or higher, yes, we did. It's very possible that we'll have a big risk off opportunity. That means dollar strong stock market down. It's exactly what happened. Okay. <laughs> okay. Nice, right? Holy smokes. Okay. They are going to take out interest rate cuts. That is the assumption. So, one of the things you should be watching.
is this. If it loads. Bum, 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 bum. Dude, we just crushed that news, huh? <laughs> we just totally crushed that. Wow. All right. In 21 days, will the Fed cut? No. All right. So right now it's at 97.3. A month ago, it was 76. Percent chance that they would, right? That we would be where it is. A week ago, it was 99.3. And yesterday, it was 99.7. Now, or 97.7. Now it's 97.3. So um, there was... A 25% chance a month ago, the Fed would have cut by now or will cut in May. No chance now. So you can see the change. Now, as this change goes, right, That what's happening is this is moving things to the right. We call this the Johnny trade, right, Johnny? We call this the Johnny trade. Because Johnny said he was going to watch this every day. And if these things are moving to the right, so from 75 to 100, which is to the right, you end up buying dollar. So that's done and dusted. So now we go over to the June. That's the big one that we're all worried about. Okay. Okay. Yeah, awesome, Johnny. I was just thinking, like, I think it was yesterday, Johnny. I'm like, I need to get together for a drink with Johnny. <laughs> I need another, right? I need I need another old-fashioned. Yeah, I got to get to New York. I got to get out of this office. <laughs> I got to I gotta go. We got to go anywhere, right? It's like, let's go to, I need to get back to New York. New York City. So anyways, um, a month ago, there was a 75% chance interest rates would have been cut by June, either at the June meeting or before the June meeting. Okay. And that's changed dramatically now. Now it's 50-50. That's dollar strong. Huh? Yeah, that's right. That was crazy, right? New York doesn't get that hot very often. What a crazy day that was. All right. So, June, cut. July, pause. September, cut cut. November, pause. December, cut. That's what I predicted in January. Okay. So we'll see if this ends up happening. Right now, it's only a 50-50 chance. Let's see what happens by tomorrow. You'll be able to compare. Okay. For example, Yesterday, there was a 60% chance that they would cut. Now it's only a 40% chance. 56.6. Okay. So I called that 60. And now it's only a 43.4. Just now because of today. Right, Richard says, yeah, the S&P 500 is falling. Well, you're supposed to be prepared for that. It's not unexpected. It's not illogical. I showed on QuantBox today, and maybe I'll bring that up. Why don't we just bring that up? I want to show you something. Oops. Got to type in the right letters, Wayne. 
Okay, quant box. Okay, uh, why is the S&P 500 falling? Okay, great. Let's go in. Let me log in. I hope I'm in the right browser. So this is my AI that does macroeconomic analysis. Tradars does technical analysis. Quantbox does fundamental analysis. All right. So uh, I covered this earlier today, again, in the Quantbox video that I do every morning. It's up on YouTube right now if you want to see it. I don't mind. Um, one of the things we looked at is the uh, stock market. And I looked at S&P 500. And... Uh, Wait, that's not the one I wanted. What? Uh, I was looking at the COT versus. Uh, unless this just changed. <laughs> Maybe this just changed. Uh, then I don't remember the stat I was going to bring up. I, I expected this to be different. Uh, what I expected to see was um, institutional had already exited S&P 500. And retail was still very heavily long. But maybe that just changed. Uh, uh, I don't know. Maybe I just remember it wrong. Anyways, right. I just want to quickly, since we're here, might as well look at the risk gauges. Yeah, that's gone from a three to a two. That's interesting how this will start impacting. Uh, I suspect we're going to get a new underlying interest trend. This creates the reversal we've been waiting for. Okay, moving around the world. And here is, okay, uh, this was not a prediction down, by the way. It was a discussion, conversation. You had to be there. All right, so what we were talking about is taking out the stops. Okay. Okay. So what are you going to do? Are you going to try buying a dip? Have you decided? Okay, you already missed your 66. Look at the it dropped 66 for you. I don't use Fibonacci. I use Wayne Inachi. I don't use a 618. I use a 66. The reason I do this is I'm trying to show you that these tools are not magic. It's insane to think that you're going to trade a 618 Fibonacci retracement because that's the way the skin grows on a sea star. Or that's how the pattern on the skin of a pineapple. Like, dude, that's stupid. Don't, don't believe any of that nonsense. Uh, so I use 66 and it works just as good. I look, I use a 33, 50, 66. 50 is not a fib number. 33.3 .3 is not a fib number. 66.6 .6 is not a fib number. So get over the magic. All you're supposed to do is buy a dip. Which dip? I don't care. Okay, buy a dip. <clears throat> All right. So I, I, I hope, I, I, I apologize if I burst your bubble. Yeah. Right, big fella? 333 and 666. It, it's just one third, half, two thirds. It's just as good. Which, I, what I'm trying, again, what I'm trying to show you, uh, show you is there's no... Uh, mysticism. There's no magic. There's no natural forces at work here. Oh, look at the cherry blossom. It has a perfect 618 Fibonacci ratio. It's just natural. What a bunch of baloney that is. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. Oh, 
I don't want to look at that grumpy cat because I can't manage him while I'm coaching. But probably not, right? Yeah. Cool. But my job today will be uh, to likely consider hedging my, um, my stock portfolios and my treasury portfolio. In fact, that's actually what I want to look at. And I guess we're not open yet. Um, the thing that I'm concerned about today is this yield. Okay. I need the yield to go down. Oops. Okay. I need that yield to go down because I, I own not the 10 year, but the 20 year. So my, all right. My duration risk is on the 20 because of the convexity of these bond yields. Um, my, my average duration is 20, not 10. Yeah, so now we're up to 4.5. And, you know, again, I talked about that two hours ago. Um, so that's, that's kind of my concern. What do I want to do with that? If the Fed's not going to cut three times but only one, I might be in too early. And I might maybe need to rotate out of that. So maybe I cash out of that today. And with my cash, I, uh, I triple leverage short the S&P or the NASDAQ. And I already have that written out. I've already trained everybody on this. So, um, so we go back to here. And, uh, okay, SPXS. That's a triple leverage short. ETF. Yeah. Notice it started at our projected high for the year. Did you know that? On January 1st, 5,283. Mm. Well, Richard's saying uh, 10 year over 4.3 was a bull point. Once again, you have to then answer why. And you would say, well, it's a 50% retracement from the previous low to high rally, which created the yield of 4.3, but it's based on price. So that would be the type of analysis. You can't just say, right? Anything you, anytime you throw down uh, 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 an opinion, you have to back it up by answering why. Okay. Okay. Well, so like, for example, I run an organization called the CIA, the Council of Investment Advisors. And we specifically looked at the chart for the 20-year treasury market. Saw the, the, the buy, which I think was March, and then have seen the decline Wait, no, February, then the rally, and then the decline late March into April. And so we've already looked at it. I've already discussed it. Um, we like the buy. We're, we don't like the drop, of course, but we understand it. it it's, uh, the market was way too dovish, right? They, they expected six rate cuts. <laughs> Forget it. That was stupid. So anyway, so... Um, so now if the Fed does cut, well, now this, this, this would be in question. Maybe they don't cut until December now. But if they did cut, that asset would go up and the, and the yield would drop. But now, like, if I said, well, maybe I go to cash on that because, uh, you know, I bought low, it went high, it came back, we're at 50%. But if they're not going to cut till December then we'll probably go all the way back. So what I could do is just say, all right, um, I'll get my, give me my money back. 
and I get out of that position and then I get short this position. So if I remember correctly, the the 20 year treasury is uh, 14% of my portfolio. Okay. So I could get out of that and then triple leverage it because this is a 3x, a 3x short. This is triple leveraged selling S&P 500. So I get three, right? So all of a sudden, it becomes a much bigger position in the portfolio, which I could leave my longs because I don't intend to get out of the stock market. Whether it's NASDAQ, uh, I own NASDAQ, I own S&P 500, I own the Dow, the biggest position being S&P 500. So I could use that, benefit from that, triple, uh, and hedge it out. I earn a, a small yield on this triple leverage. I think it's about 6%. Okay, The rest of the portfolio is averaging 10%. So that pulls me down to maybe a 9% income level. And what that means is even if the stock market drops 25% this year, I'm still going to collect 9% cash in my pocket. No matter what. And then what? If I never get out of these trades and I'm, I'm already got built-in hedges and I'm managing beta... Remember, S&P 500 has less beta than the NASDAQ. So I'm already in the lower vol. And I have a guarantee, well, nearly guaranteed yield, which is, let's say, another 10% hedge. And then I actually do a hedge, which then lowers my volatility even more. I think in one year or two years or three years, the stock market will be higher than now, okay? Then this, this drawdown in um, capital gains is an illusion. Okay? Do you see that? There's two, there's two things you look at in constructing a portfolio. Your capital gains and your income, otherwise known as dividends, or I guess you can do dividend income. Let's do it that way. Okay, so let's say the stock market drops 25% this year. Okay. And then rallies next year to break even. So you go from negative 25 to break even. And then uh, one year later, so now we're 2026, uh, let's say it's up 10%. How many people think that's somewhat reasonable. Maybe not 25% decline. Let me put a 20% decline. So this year, down 20. Next year, we earn it back. And then the year after, slightly up. How many people agree with that assessment? That... The next two years, okay, we've had our high. So the next two years kind of looks like this. Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? So from the peak. So it's not like lose everything this year, lose our 10% this year and then go negative. Just, right? All right, cool. So how does this work? This is the value Okay, so I have a paper loss of 20, but I never, I never exit. 
I own. I'm an owner. It's like an apartment building. I'm not going to sell this position. I can hedge it. I can manage the beta. Um, there's stuff that it's built to be conservative. In fact, I have a, f right, right? This portfolio that I've constructed or the portfolio I've constructed with the CIA has 40% less vol volatility. So really, if it drops 20%, um, my portfolio will probably drop 12% just by the way I constructed it. Hmm. Okay, but whatever. Let's go back. Let's say it drops 20, not 12. Let's just say it has 100% same beta. The beta is 1. So it drops every little bit, okay? Okay. Then it recovers the next year, and then it's slightly higher. Well, every year, I'm going to collect about 10%. It doesn't matter. I'm not going to adjust any of this. So I'm going to write in dividend income. So how much did I really lose? Minus 10. Okay. Then we get back to break even, and I collect another 10%. plus 10. Then another year, I collect another 10% plus 10. So I, ha right, I outperform the market. Okay, isn't that nice? Meanwhile, I will buy the dip. So my choice now is I, I'm already hedged, in a sense, by the way I constructed the portfolio. Okay, and my vol up to now, I don't know the future vol, but I have 40% less volatility than the S&P 500. Cool. So we'll see how it does it on the way down. We haven't had a down market since I built this, um, um, this pension fund. Okay. So I don't have to freak out, but I do need to manage this. And it is not unexpected. Okay. It's been the topic of, cons of conversation for about five weeks. In fact, we talked about hedging. So the CIA did a per, uh, portfolio performance review. The CIA. Okay, we met on Monday. That's why, I, right, I know all these numbers. And once we analyzed the performance of the portfolio, guess what? What did we talk about for another half an hour? Hedging strategy. Well, no, it's not a no. It's not, it's not a vol play per se, David. It's uh, it's designed for retirement accounts and endowments. So I manage three endowments now, plus my own pension fund. So I manage four funds, and. Endowments and retirement accounts must, 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 must earn income. So if there is like a museum that has a million dollar endowment or a $10 million endowment, the $10 million earns income through investing. And then the museum budgets based on the money earned from the endowment. So if it's 10 million, the, if the 10 million is, an, um, you know, if the endowment is 10 million, then the museum runs on a million dollar a year budget. And they know how to pay their rent, pay the electrical bills, pay their staff, have insurance, and maybe uh, buy some uh, rotating exhibits and do some marketing. But they need to know the million dollars is there, right, David? 
So there's t there's a couple of things that, that's going on here. They don't need capital gains. You don't build a stock portfolio for an endowment because you think Apple is going to go up 25%. Well, if Apple goes up 25%, you have to sell your Apple sh shares and then it's a taxable event. And Oh my God. And then what do you do with the money? Well, then you got to go find something new to do. No, no, no. All of that is risky. It's just risky. That's, that's not how these endowments work. So you need to be able to produce income. The second thing is because they rely on you to make money, you can never, ever, 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 ever be in a situation where you don't earn income. Because if you don't earn income, which means you have to construct your portfolio correctly, um, if your stocks lose value and stop paying money and stop paying dividends and all that kind of stuff, then the museum will have to lay people off and maybe close on Mondays and Tuesdays and not fulfill the mission of their organization. Right? Right. So they're in the insurance. Right. So it, what I'm saying is it, it's, I have two mandates. One, do whatever it takes to earn cash, not capital gains. Nobody cares about capital gains. Now you want to buy assets that go up in value, but if you own a Bitcoin, you can't buy you can't eat your Bitcoin. You can't, you're right. You have to like sell the Bitcoin kind of thing. If you own Apple shares and it's doubled, well, you can't eat that. It's just sitting there in your portfolio. And in theory, it's worth twice as much as you paid for it, but you haven't sold it. It's like you're, the price of your house has gone up $100,000. Well, that it's pointless unless you sell your house. But then if you sell your house, you have nowhere to live. And if everything else has gone up a hundred thousand, then 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 what? So congratulations, your house went up a hundred thousand, but if you sold it, you couldn't afford to buy a new house. So really, did it go up a hundred thousand, or is it irrelevant? Well, you know, endowments face these types of challenges, but also retired people. So, right? So you got to get in a situation where you got to buy the safest, lowest risk assets or construct it to be the safest and lowest and earn that income. And I am very, very happy to say that my, my, my funds earn a lot of income. Now, my pension and the endowments, uh, my pension's tax deferred, uh, nonprofit organizations don't pay taxes. So um, it does, right? It earns a lot of income. Now, usually earning a lot of income isn't desirable for a regular person because then you have to pay it like you have a job. You have to pay 40% taxes. Ugh. Okay. So nobody wants that. That's why it's appropriate for endowments and, um, and pension funds like I run. So I'm, pr I'm proud to say that I'm earning 10% income, which is huge. And I have 40% less volatility than the S&P 500. And I do have capital gains. It's, uh, well, I'll say it's extraordinary, but I don't want to get too excited because we've only been running it for about five or six months. But we are running it with my cash in a legitimate Wall Street investment firm that, um, you know, with real people in it. <laughs> and when the CIA gets together, we actually log into my account. Now, I use a different account to analyze it. But I've actually, when we go to buy the stock, so the CIA, we, we discuss what to buy. We have these like three-hour conversations and then eventually we decide um, the balance of the allocation. And sometimes, you know, we could rotate the, 
uh, around. We can rotate funds ar around the portfolio. Mostly we allocate or kill and then reallocate. And so we allocate and we say, okay, we want to buy um, $8,000 of, uh, let's say, NASDAQ. So then what we do is I go out of my analysis tool, and this is in front of the rest of the CIA, right? So they made a decision, okay, buy $8,000 worth of NASDAQ. So then I open up my, the, wall, the actual Wall Street uh, you know, platform. We log into my account. We go into it. Everybody sees all the positions. And then they watch me buy $8,000 worth of NASDAQ right then and there. As soon as we vote, we all vote. Yep, yep, yep. Great, great, great. I, will, I do it right then and there. And uh, I think it's extraordinary. Even the process of watching me double and triple check the trade is pretty cool, I think. We have so much fun. Okay. Now, Frank says, uh, uh, how do you pay your... Well, so... If you are managing an endowment, okay, then what what happens is you you and th this is standard, right? So I I studied all this at Harvard. This is what you do when you get a master's degree in Harvard. We I literally studied how to manage endowments, and I I reviewed actual endowments. I talked to the Harvard endowment person, the Yale endowment person. Um, the uh, Lincoln Center, the performance, uh, uh, performing center of the arts in New York City, um, even a little museum in where was it, Ohio or something. Um, but here, here's the standard process. Okay, so d let's say David Pegler uh, is a fund manager. Okay, so a portfolio manager. Okay, and he is hired to work for the uh, endowment, okay? What is traditional endowment, okay? What is traditional is David would have to, in, in compliance or in alignment with the board of the endowment, so now you have a board and you have a finance subcommittee to which you you actually sit and report to. So again, I, I'm I'm I do this for nonprofit, right? So I sit on the board, I I report to the subcommittee and to the treasurer and everything like that, but also to the general board. Okay. So anyway, so the the endowment hires David Pegler. He's a portfolio manager. He then constructs or advises to the construction of the port endowment portfolio because he's a portfolio manager. He's an outside advisor. Okay. And his objective now is to build and construct a portfolio that has low vol. And so we were talking about this, right? Is that the objective? Well, the objective is low volatility. You can't you can't be in a situation where you're up 25% one year and down 25%. You just can't do it. You'll break the endowment. So you have to have consistently vol low vol, but the highest thing, even more important than that, because you can ride out the storm if you have a 10, 15 year investment horizon, right? So there, therefore, income okay, is the goal with low vol. Now, then you take that, well, how much income? Well, if David's portfolio can earn 10%, okay, then David's firm collects 20% of the 10%, which is 2%, okay? Just imagine it's a, on a million dollars or a hundred million dollars or a billion dollars, okay, whatever. He produces, he produces 10, he collects some himself, and the endowment has a budget now that runs on the industry standard of 8%. So this is all standardized. 
I do it for free because I'm a kick-ass person. So I don't charge at all. So the nonprofit keeps the full 10. And so David David's firm gets fired because my firm does it for cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. So, anyways, that's how the world works. Isn't that interesting? Uh, can you show us some charts? Charts for what? I'm subscribed to Quantbox. Okay, so you have that, and you need a heads up to what to look for. Did you, um, I mean, you watch the daily video, right, Grumpy Cat? Uh, there's various different uh, options overlays on top of uh, assets. There's many different versions. Yeah. And I'm trying to add more diversification uh, through, so like, we, like I, I, I'm exposed to an average duration of um, of twenty percent in treasuries. So I have a small portion. I think it's fourteen percent in treasuries, right? With an average duration of twenty, because I feel in my research that it's got the best convexity, which simply means when the Fed eventually cuts. The 20 year will make more money because of its sensitivity to the change in interest rates than the 10 year. And more money than the 30 year because they have different sensitivities. And that's what most people think duration means how long you hold it. And when I talk about duration and duration risk, it's not that there's a one year, a five year, a 10 year, a 20 year, and a 30 year. And this is very much misunderstood. So people would say, well, longer duration means longer time. No, what it means is the, the sensitivity of these assets relative to a change in the Fed funds rate is different. For example, a quarter percent cut will not impact the one year that much. Almost nothing. You'll you'll lose 50 cents. But a quarter percent over 30 years adds up. Just look at, do a mortgage calculation. If, right? So my, like, for example, my mortgage is 3%. You might have a 5%. And someone else getting a new one might have a 7% mortgage, Right? What's the big deal between three, five, and seven? Hundreds, well, it depends on what your, your, you know, your underlying debt is, but um, it's very, 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 very significant because it's over 30 years. Now, the interesting thing, though, is it's not perfectly, like, there, what we mean by convexity is, like, if it was exactly this uh, five years is 10% more expensive and and this is 10% more expensive and then this is double. So that's 20% more and then this is 50% of that. So then, you know, whatever. Like it's not linear. The, ch the difference over time is not linear. So when you draw this, so let's do it as a chart now as you're supposed to. Linear would mean they're exactly perfectly equal. So you know, the 30 year would be 30 times more sensitive than the one year. That would be logical, but it's not actually true. And you end up getting this. And do you see it's curved? So when I'm talking about the convexity, I'm saying that this part of the curve is where I want to be. I don't want to be here, and I don't want to be here. <laughs> and, and this doesn't make me enough money. Um, so you, you reject the absolute, 
you reject the mediocrity and then you this is right and you want to be positioned here and you average it out the time left so that's duration on your treasury portfolio and in particular you build this up so that you average okay a position aka duration that benefits most based on the convexity or sensitivity of these assets to a change in the Fed funds rate over time. Oh my God, that's so awesome, isn't it? Now, David, uh, your question about structured. Um, so one of my buddies that runs a, a Forex fund, he does all structured products. He's a Forex guy, right? Uh, he knows me through uh, watching YouTube videos and uh, and we developed a friendship, right? Because he's like, oh man, he's like, you know, he's a Forex guy, right? Um, so anyways, um, he goes to a bank. He only works with banks. Okay. And this is interesting because a bank finances like import I guess, I guess I should do it this way, an M instead of, right? Um, so imports and exports, right? Oh, I did it again. I can't talk and write at the same time. Okay, imports and exports, right? So, and this is like a, a real situation. One of the banks he works with is in Australia. And this bank is financing... Uh, an export deal out of Australia to China. Let's say it's a billion dollars of iron ore. Okay. And so I'm sure you have to have, uh, uh, right, uh, not a standby letter of credit. What's the other one? Um, uh, a bank guarantee. Okay. Okay. And it's part of this thing where, okay, so iron ore is leaving and the Australian firm is worried that when it gets to China, they don't pay. So China has to get a bank guarantee or a standby letter of credit, which is another instrument, by the way, and these are all tradable instruments. So China, the China importer goes to a bank, gets the bank guarantee, and then sends it to the Australian bank to say, okay, this iron ore needs to get to China. And when it gets to China, the Chinese who have already put the money into the bank guarantee, well, then the bank guarantee gets converted uh, and the, the, the exporter gets paid. This is what banks do all the time, right? And then, so now the banks have to then, you know, fund these assets as well. Okay. So anyways, um, so the, the, there's real money on the line, right? So there's a billion dollars locked up in a bank guarantee and all this kind of stuff. Okay, great. Then along the way, and we forget, you know, you maybe you forget. I don't forget. I try to remember. It's hard to remember. But we feel like we're just playing some video game as Forex traders, right? It's just like Fortnite. Forex, Fortnite, whatever. Beep, beep, beep. I made some money on the euro dollar. Okay, great. Well... There's actually a ship out at sea, okay, filled with iron ore and coal. In this case, iron ore. And it's going from Australia to China. Everything's cool, and it's all been financed by the different banks. And the ship breaks down, okay? And it's just sitting out in the middle of the sea somewhere between Australia and China. Uh-oh, risk for the banks. Because it's not going to get delivered to China in time. And what if they call the bank guarantee back? Like, hey, man, you missed your delivery. We call our billion dollars back. So now this all has to, uh-oh. And what if the exporter, all this stuff, like, uh-oh, 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 uh-oh. Remember, it's either in dollars, but it might be Aussie dollar. 
It might be Kiwi dollar if it's a new, a new Zealand, right? So you see this? So this whole contract is in Aussie dollars. So all of a sudden, the bank's like, holy crap. We might be at risk on this deal. We might be at risk to the tune of a billion Aussie dollars or 100 million or 10 million, whatever the real number is, right? Now, he doesn't do billions. So let's just say it's 10 million. He'd take a $10 million deal. Okay, so 10 million Aussie dollars on the line now. So he, as a hedge fund and his team, he has a team of guys that also worked at banks. That's how they do this. They take the risk. They go into a contract, a structured contract for the, you know, let's say um, odd versus USD, let's say. But it could be, uh, um, it could be odd something else, depending on how the original deal was structured. But they'll show you. They'll show you that you can go through almost like shopping. What, do you, what about this deal? Do you want to buy it from us? What about this deal? Do you want to buy it from us? And then it gets to here, and he's like, okay, Aussie dollar, uh, and it has to stay uh, below price A, above price B. And then you uh, negotiate the prices, and the terms depend on how wide or how narrow, because if it's wide, you're not taking much risk. If it's narrow, you're taking more risk. And then you get better or worse offers, and then you negotiate it. And then here's the thing, uh, David, this is where it gets interesting. They, they, structure the, they structure it as a contract. And it expires on a certain day. It could be 30 days. It could be as much as 90 days. But it, it, let's say it's a longer one, 90 days. But they'll say at 30 and at 45, at 60, at 75 days, you go back and look and see how it's doing. And some of this can be renegotiated. It's not just flat out, right? And they're trading Forex with the same chart, they're doing the same analysis that we're doing on our MT4, but th there's no trade. It's a piece of paper. Now, if you agreed, let's say looking at the S&P 500, let's say you agreed that the S&P 500 in your contract that you negotiated will stay above here and stay below there. You, you, agree, you signed this contract with the bank because you believe in the pivot point here. And you believe in this pivot point here. And so you're like, okay, I'm going to play that. So you sign that agreement and you're like, there's very little chance the S&P 500 is going to break below this annual pivot point at 51. And there's very little chance it's going to go above 53. Why? Well, that's how you do your technical analysis. That's just how you analyze your charts. So you're like, we have a good probability this is going to move sideways. And if you move sideways in this contract... Every, Friday, uh, every other Friday, you get paid. You might collect 40 grand every other week or whatever the term is, 90 grand every, every other week or every week probably. Uh, every, every Friday at the close, if you're in between here, you collect 90 grand. Because you're taking the risk off, they're selling you the risk. They're giving you a discount, which is like a built-in 2% profit or whatever, right? So anyway, so it's all built in there. And if, the con if now price goes below, what you need to do is go to your chart and hedge by actually taking some of your cash. So hopefully, if you collected 90 grand here, 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 next week you collect 90 grand, and then uh, two weeks from now we're back here, you're no longer collecting 90 grand. So hopefully, you've saved some of this money and now you start hedging here to offset the losses. You're making money here to offset the losses there. And then at some looking point, remember I said like every, uh, every 15 days there might be a look back and you might renegotiate. It'll cost you some money, but you're like, okay, let's now that we're below here, let's renegotiate th this process. And, we all, and the bank even agrees like none of this is relevant anymore. So they have to look at their risk and their costs and their loss. And, and you remember, the bank doesn't want to carry risk on their books. They want, they want to be risk neutral. That's why they'll sell it to a hedge fund. And if they take a 2% loss, it's better than a 20% risk. 
right? So they'll sell that to somebody else. So it's kind of cool. Now, you still have to know, let's say, your 5A crosses and your pivot points, right? But isn't it interesting how you can do the exact same game, but absolutely, totally, completely different? And there are scenarios where they might design it so that there's actually a direction, not just sideways. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. But what I what I what I'm trying to get across there, guys, is that it's Forex and it's exactly what we do. It's exactly what I teach. You have to be able to know all the same stuff. Have the right tools, be able to analyze the market, understand um you know, price action and predictive tools. You need to know your fundamentals. You need to know your technicals. Like if you don't know if the Aussie dollar is going to go up or down in the next three months, you can't do a deal like that. You wouldn't be able to choose the right contract and structure it properly if you didn't have an opinion where Aussie dollar is going to be in three months. You couldn't do anything. So if you're in a situation where like you have no opinion about the Aussie dollar right now or the New Zealand dollar right now, and you're wondering why you can't trade well, you're not getting the results you expected as a Forex trader, it's because you don't know what the heck you're doing. But once you get past that, now you can trade almost anything. Like, if you, right, let's, you, I like pivot points, I like price action. Those are the things I need most. And then with Quantbox, I need like seasonality. And I need to know the economic data so that I can understand the monetary policy of the central banks in those economies. And so with those tools, I can have reasonable opinions backed by actual facts through macroeconomics and quantitative analysis and technical analysis where I could structure a product or trade spot or trade futures. It wouldn't matter to me. Okay. Yeah. So no matter how you want to trade, whether it's an endowment, your own account, you want to work for a bank, you want to work for a hedge fund, you want to start your own hedge fund. It doesn't matter. You have to have the basic building blocks. You have to have an opinion on direction and the capability to exercise the strategy with proper tactics. And then if you understand those basics, you can do anything. Now the tools I've built automate and handle all the grunt work for you. This is doing all the grunt work. Okay. You see that? Tradars is doing the grunt work for you. Did you notice? Just as we've been talking, Tradars is like, oh my God, sell Nikkei, sell Dow, sell NASDAQ, sell FTSE, sell, 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 sell. sell. It's doing all the grunt work for you, drawing out the charts. And then Quantbox is just ridiculously amazing automating the grunt work of macroeconomics. So think about it this way. You're going to trade like a billion dollar hedge fund. You're a portfolio manager and you have a staff that works for you. You have a quant and you have a technical analyst. And every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, they're working for you. And whenever you want the information, you have your technical analyst and your quant report to you. Risk off, risk off. The underlying trend is risk off. Oh my God, buy the dollar, buy the dollar. How does it make the conclusion? VIX is up, that's bad. Yields are up, that's bad. Dollar is strong. That's bad. S&P 500 is still hanging on. 
all over the month over month, but not week over week. So this is turning negative as well. Yen is weak that month over month, but currently, uh oh, so that can turn bad pretty soon too. Total bad, bad, and probably getting worse. And you know this in seconds. Are you kidding me? You want the COT report? You want to see the change in capital flows? Yeah. Okay, this will change now. And you'll see the, the stock and the flow is going to change next week. You'll see. How's the market reacting to this news that just came out? Can you see this? This is like live. Yields are way up. Bitcoin's down. Oh, no. Okay, this is expected. This is expected. This is the results. Yeah, it's a big deal. But are you looking at seasonality? Whoa. Are you, are you doing price forecasting? Whoa. Whoa. Uh-oh. 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 You see this? You knew this yesterday. Euro dollar pointing down yesterday. Well, now we're way down. Well, you should have known. It's doing advanced calculations. Tick, right? It's like, look, this is heading back to the daily 21. How does it figure that out? Y equals MX plus B. So therefore, it's looking at it through the lens of calculus. Okay. Y and X axes. B is the intercept, which is there, okay, roughly. And then what? What is M? M, you have to take the average of all these daily, right? You take the average, and then each time calculate the mean, okay? M in Y equals MX plus B. Let's do it again. Y axis equals M times the x-axis plus b. So m is equal to, you want to calculate the average. Right now it looks this way. And the slope, right? So rise over run. The slope is equal to a negative integer, let's say negative 2. Whoa! This is worst case, this is best case, and this is base case. I'll call that B star. Okay. Well, how does it calculate that? Well, you look at the average variance. You look at the variance above and below the mean, which is M, the slope of the mean. You look at the highest highs and the lowest lows, for example, to the mean. And then you take the square root of the variance to standardize the variance. What do you mean by variance? How far does price deviate from the mean before it comes back to the mean? You mean deviate? How far does it deviate before it comes back? How low is the lowest low before it snaps back? How high is the highest high before it snaps back? Yeah, you take the square root of that and you got standard deviation. Cool. Right? Right? Cool. Are you missing that? Well, you should have quant box. You want to see inst uh, institutional ver versus retail sentiment? Iron ore, copper, platinum, ethereum, it's all there. You want to know things to be very bullish on, things to be bullish on, and all the things to be neutral on? Based on rational thinking? 
Here's all the things to be bearish on. There's nothing to be very bearish on yet. How does it make this determination? It, interest rate differentials, the labor market, inflation, GDP, technical trends, seasonality, retail sentiment, commitment to traders report, which is institutional positioning. Dude, this is insane. How do you predict the future 18 months in advance? We pulled data out of the central banks. So, right, here's inflation forecasted by the Fed. They said 3.37. We're above that. We know this. This came out of the Fed. 3.37 was the average projected inflation level for the, uh, wait, this is the wrong year. Uh, uh, two, we're here, right? We're supposed to be below three. And we're rising above three on the way to three and a half. Uh-oh, so the Fed's dot plot will probably need to change. And that's what's happening right now. And this is the projected path of rate cuts by... Told to us by the Fed. This is not AI predicting anything. This is what the FOMC has told us. And we pull this data directly out. Well, not directly, indirectly out of the Fed. Oh, my God. So somebody asked, well, what about gold? I don't know. What do you think? Do you need to buy gold to hedge rising inflation? If so, what are the prices you in intend to buy today, tomorrow, next week? Golly, huh? So what do you think? Wow. CPI was 3.2. Now it's 3.5. Very bullish for gold. Okay. But priced in dollar, huh? Well, it's strong for dollar so gold and dollar you think gold and dollar would go up but dollar and gold would go down if that makes sense and then of course year over year no change no difference so you can see here so old inflation new inflation isn't this beautiful so you have to price you can price in dollar what about yen isn't that cool? And if you want Rand, my, my, that I put that in there for my South African brothers and sisters. Okay. All right. So anyway, that's it. I'm done. I'm spent. That was great. Happy Wednesday, everybody. So look at all the links here. They're all in the description below. If I have a video, uh, do I have a video going here? Oh, this is this me or is this later? How to prepare for... Uh, this is not... No, that's the... Am I here? Yeah, I guess so. Is this me? This is live, right? All right. So what I want you to point to, and this is important, hang with me here. Okay. Investor Boot Camp, there's a free 90-minute video for you. Quant Box, there's an $8 trial. Tradeplans.ai is still live, but I think I'm going to kill it. It's, I think I'm going to kill Aiden. Nobody wants to pay for it, so I'm going to kill him. So a real entity is going to die. 
There, a quant box, there's a great video in which I show you my first trading strategy, and it just happened to be quantitative. Yeah, Bank of Canada in two minutes. I mean, do you guys want me to stay for Bank of Canada? I'll stay if we can get some likes. Maybe that'll help YouTube. All right, I'll stay if we can get significantly more likes. Right now, it's about 50%. Really? Okay, one minute. One minute. One minute. Let's take a look at it. Dollar CAD. If the actual is higher, okay, if they raise, 100% chance of up. And there's no, uh, there's no other reliable pattern for USD CAD. What? So this is a, a little bit of a dangerous trade. This is a little bit of a dangerous trade, y'all. Five, they kept pause just as expected. Okay, as expected. Okay, Canadian dollar strong. The Bank of Canada today held its target for the overnight rate at 5% with the bank rate of 5 and a quarter and the deposit of 5. The bank is continuing its policy of quantitative tightening, a.k.a. selling bonds, treasuries. The bank expects global, the global economy to continue growing at the rate of 3% with inflation in most advanced economies easing gradually. The U.S. economy again has proven stronger than anticipated, buoyed by the resilient by resilient consumption and robust business and government spending. U.S. GDP growth is expected to slow in the second half of the year, but remain stronger than forecast in January. The euro area is projected to gradually recover from its current weak growth. Okay, well, that weak growth might make them cut. Global oil prices have moved up, averaging about $5 higher and assume, uh, than assumed back in January in the monetary policy report. Since January, bond yields have increased, but with narrow corporate credit spreads and sharply higher equity markets, overall fin financial conditions have eased. The bank has revised its forecast of global GDP growth to two and three quarters and then 3% the year after, and the year after that. Inflation continues to grow, uh, slow amongst most advanced economies. But it'll be bumpy. They think next year inflation targets are, uh, are going to be hit. In Canada, economic growth stalled in the second half of last year. Yeah, no kidding. And the economy moved into excess supply. A broad range of indicators suggest that the labor market conditions continue to ease. Employment has been growing more slowly than the working age population. And the unemployment rate has risen gradually, reaching 6.1 in March. 
There are some recent signs that the wage pressures are moderating. Yeah, people are losing jobs and employers don't have to pay much to get somebody to replace them. Economic growth, growth is forecast to pick up next year. Great. Who cares about next year, huh? Overall, the bank forecast GDP growth of 1.5. It's terrible, but not zero. CPI inflation slowed to 2.8 in February, easing the price pressures. Why? Canadians don't have any money, they're not spending any money, and they're losing their jobs, or they're afraid of losing their jobs, so they don't spend any money. Okay, TradeRs has updated itself, which is interesting. It's saying, hey, if the actual is equal to five, remember this didn't, it wasn't on this page earlier. Here are some probable trade plans to consider. Okay, and then you say, how did you get to this? And I don't know, it, it, it's kind of guessing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of guessing because there's no the reason it didn't give us this before is that there was no historical events to back it up or maybe I, I misclicked I guess I misclicked sorry so the consensus was five the actual was five the delta was zero the two hour trend 70 percent chance the trend is up because in January it trended up in December, it trended up. In September, it trended up. In July, it trended up. In March, it trended up. And in January of 2023, it trended up. And in December of 2020, it dropped but closed higher. That's years and years of data. Oh, my God. Hmm. Okay, and that's just USD CAD. It can do the same thing for all these pairs for you on all these different time frames. But if you want to know what to do with a 90% chance of accuracy in the past, or let's say 90% performance in the past, if you want to know that information, maybe you you uh, you you try trade ours. What do you think? Starts at 19 bucks, 59 bucks, and it gets even better. There's some pretty, there's some pretty killer stuff going on here. Okay. These are some pretty killer upgrades. But if you ain't got no money, uh, this is great. And if you really ain't got no money or you don't trust it, you can try it out the email only version you get about 10 or 12 trade plans a day emailed to you bef right before the new york open so if it's london lunch for you or new york open you'll get some technical trade plans sent to you for you to think about meanwhile maybe you're scalping USD kitty cat because of the 70% chance of up based on past performance. Okay, now I'm done. Okay, now I'm done. Oh, that was so good. Oh, that was so good. Oh, that was good. So high five, everybody. Huh? High five. That was sweet, right? Yeah. We need to invite David Pegler to Investor Boot Camp. David Pegler did a video series on price action 12 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe longer. And uh, I, if I remember correctly, his verse video has 
he had the wrong microphone on and you could barely hear him and all this kind of stuff. Maybe we should get him back and say, hey, David, are you even, you, David, you were great at techni- at uh, price action 12 years ago. How are you now? What, how, right? How are you now? You must be better. And you're, and you're like, I don't know if you can be better. Uh-huh. Right? Grumpy's like, I'm the only one that clicked the like button. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So anyway, so uh, that's great. Yeah. Well, I think you did four videos. I, I probably even have the original slide deck. Isn't that funny? I probably have your original slide deck. Yeah, David and I had so much fun when when he was a, a coach at FX Bootcamp. We had so much fun going to conferences. Uh, when he became a coach, I'm like, hey man, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you into you know magazines and stuff, and I'm gonna get you on FX Street, and I'm like I'm gonna do everything I can to help you become a leader in forex because I think you're a great trader, but an even better human being. And you can imagine how much fun we had doing stuff like that. And I'll never forget like the days where we set up the the FX Bootcamp uh, booth. I used to have this huge, huge twenty by ten booth, and we'd set them up at conferences, and we'd all go, and the whole coaching staff would be there, and twenty five FX Bootcamp volunteers, and we'd build this thing, and then during the conference, we'd actually do we called them boothinars, and so. You know, people would be walking around the the expo and right there on the floor of the expo, we were just doing training and stuff. And it was so good. Uh, I, I remember uh, Kurt Worley talking about R, trying to explain statistical analysis and quantitative analysis to just random people walking around. And he's like, think of R as likeness, you know. Oh, my God. Oh, we had so much fun. Right. And then, of course, one one time, and 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 D- David, you were right there too. Like all the guys there, I remember you were right next to me, and I think Chris was right next to me, and we had some uh, some boot camp volunteers. I think was it the guy from Hawaii that came out? Anyways, I'm standing there with the crew, and there was like another fifteen people standing around, but these guys were like almost right next to me, and this guy that was famous for writing books. And he said you know, he went to Japan and he found the secret books in Japanese talking about candlestick patterns. And he, he spent years translating them, the secret message of Japanese candlesticks, and wrote it all in English. And, and, uh, and now he was selling the books for like $500 a piece. <laughs> right? And, uh, well... He got banned from the show for, let's just say, scummy uh, business practices. Because <laughs> he also had training courses and stuff, right? So anyway, so we have this huge FX boot camp presence. We're like just rocking this show. And again, David's standing right next to me, but talking to somebody else. And I think Chris was standing next to me, talking to somebody else. And there's people behind us all talking to people. Like the, the dedication that that our community had was crazy. And he comes right up to me. This guy comes up to me and he's like, Hey, right. He's like, we should work together. And I'm like, why? He's like, we can make a lot of money together. <laughs> and so all of a sudden the, I can sense the rest of the community turning like, oh, 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 you know, here we go. Right. Well, like, what, what, what is this all about? And I looked at him and I said, well, I already have a lot of money. And he just stared, stood there, staring, <laughs> stared at me. I'm like, why would I whore out my community, my friends, my, my, you know, my family? Like, that's not what the point of FX Bootcamp is. Like, everyone's here doing this on their own time and volunteering and helping other people. Um, you know, so I looked at him like, well, I already got a lot of money. And he looked at me and there was no response. And then I think he just walked away. 
just like just walked away. It was just funny. I like high five, high five, high five. Yeah. And and off we go doing our stuff. Oh man, we had right such a great time. Such a great time. Yeah. Yeah, the downtown. And of course the one in Vegas that we did, right? Uh, I think that was your first boot camp jamboree when I had that huge penthouse um, and we got all the boot campers together and we didn't even get past the introduction. We were there for four hours and I, and I did a little speech and then I'm like, okay, let's go around the room and just introduce our, ourselves. Just one or two minutes, pl- right? Just one or two minutes, please. Four hours later, we finish our introduction and people are crying and they're like, I love you, man. And people flew out. Remember, Hakuyama flew out from Japan and everything. And there were there was hugging and crying and like, oh, my God. Yeah. So we got some we got some good days for sure. Some good days. Yeah. Amazing. So here it is. You know, FX Boot Camp is now Investor Boot Camp and is 20 years old, huh? How about that? Well, I'd like to thank everybody here for being part of that community because that's all it is, is a community. We've had a thriving community for 20 years. And it's strange from my point of view. Um, I, I thought this would be sort of, I don't know if I could say temporary, but it was sort of an experiment when I started. I, uh, I, I was failing as a trader for a while when I had quit my job as a VC and I'm working in my my home office and everything. And I went through a really bad period and, and I was losing money and I, I needed to make money. I mean, I gave up my dream job, right? And so I did that business planning retreat everyone's heard about a million times. And I'm like, okay, I need to surround myself with other successful people because that always made me a success. And so I started, you know, FX Bootcamp. And all of this was just kind of an experiment, like to get me out of my slump, I will teach people what I do know. And that includes the mistakes I've made. I, I wasn't thinking 20 years. I'm like, I'm thinking, how do I get out of my rut? And the only way I knew to get people to hang out with me is just tell them every, everything I knew. Cool. All right. Great. And then I remember developing, you know, a relationship with FX Street and um, and I had just been a keynote speaker at the first Forex Trading Expo. So having two years of experience made me the, <laughs> the oldest man in the room. Um, and so I started working with FX Street and we had all these conversations and I did two or three different um, uh, presentations with them before we got an idea of let's do something radical. Let's do non-farm payrolls. We'll do it live. And last Friday was the 18th year of doing that every month. I'll never forget where my dad, because I had little itty bitty children, and um, my dad was at our place in California. And, you know, and I lived in California at the time. So I'm in my home office and I'm doing trade non-farm payrolls live number one. 18 years ago. So uh, I had very, very young children, right? Oh, no, that's not why he was there. No, we were about to go to the hospital. My dad was there in case we had to like, oh, that's right. So my anyways, my dad's hanging out in my home. I'm doing non-farm payrolls. And I come out. And uh, out of the room after three hours, and he's in the living room having breakfast. And he's like, hey, how'd it go? And I said, it was great. I think we had like a thousand people. He's like, oh, that's amazing. And I'm like, yeah, it was good. And my father says to me, I think you should keep doing it. I'm like, Why? It's a special event. Nobody does three-hour events. At, even now, nobody does three-hour events at Epic Street. And he looked at me and he said, 
well, I think you're making a difference. I think you're helping. And I said, cool. Yeah, I think you're right. I'll keep doing it. When is it? 261 months later, we're still doing it. So like, awesome stuff. Like, thank you. I'm thanking you for being the community that is worthy of this type of commitment and, and investment and relationships. And, you know, I'll never forget the first day I met David Pegler. I remember it exactly via email. I could find the email. And here he is all these years later. Everything is awesome. Isn't that great? That we have members, Jim, been here practically the entire 20 years. Just really, really cool. In fact, when David Pegler was a, 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 a member of FX Bootcamp, not even a coach, a member of FX Bootcamp learning how to trade, I'm pretty sure Jim was there too. Like, it's amazing. So thank you for such a wonderful, you know, 18 to 20 years. It's, it's really cool. And uh, I'll be here at least another 20 if you'll have me. Yeah, Jim's like, yeah, I was, yeah. See, when, when I realized that that business planning retreat, that I was alone, and that isolation was a risk that I hadn't calculated before I quit my job, I said, how will I, oh, first of all, I said, I need to, I need to surround myself with like-minded people. So in 2004, how do you build a community of people? There's no YouTube. Amazon.com was a bookstore. Apple didn't make phones. Do you imagine this world? There was no books written on Forex because people didn't trade, retail people didn't trade Forex. There were no books. The only thing I had at the time to find people was eBay. I wrote a, like a 40 page ebook. I sold it on eBay for $1, How to Trade Forex. I forget the title, but it was How to Trade Forex. People got the book for $1. And then in the book, I said, I will give you one hour free one-on-one -on -one consultation. And I gave my time away for $1 to develop relationships and then started a hot com room. Isn't that amazing? It's cool, right? So there's our origin story. So all these years later, thank you. And I'll see you another 20 years. Peace on earth. May the pips be with you. May your profits be above average. I'll see you. If, if, if you're in my day trading group, I'll see you at 4 p.m. at investorbootcamp.com. Cheers.